software engineer at Box. I help the back-end team sort of build the frameworks that they build their services on, and part of my job is to kind of be a, a frontiersman looking at advanced things, not only with just Scala, which is kind of this new shiny hotness kind of thing, even though it's, it's quite a few years old, but it's gaining popularity now. And, and then I just uh, sort of came upon this Scala Z thing, and I was like, oh, this is weird and, and kind of and challenging and intellectual, and I wanted to see if it was actually useful. So my goal is to make this, none of this confusing. Scala Z, or Scala Z if you're British. Um, so it has this reputation of being this thing that makes your brain melt or your head explode or unreadable. Um, but I'm here to argue that, well, it's certainly a marketing problem as all intellectually advanced concepts you know, tend to have. Capitalist maybe wasn't so hot when it came out. I don't know. Um, radio would probably not. <laughs> and so uh, it has a very profound mathematical basis, but I'm not going to talk about that stuff. There's tons of stuff on the web that will tell you about that, and you don't need to know that stuff to, uh, to follow what I'm going to talk about. So that's, that's a feature. But I encourage you, to, after this talk, to go look it up, because it might make more sense now after I give you some examples. I, I feel what's missing is examples. And that's, I stole this picture from a different scholar talk. I didn't make it up. Uh, so this is, uh, like I said, this is going to be about like, everyday situations. So if you are a Java programmer, I'm going to tend to look, go this way. I know there's two screens. Uh, let me know if I should walk over there. Uh, if you're a Java programmer, uh, you know, uh, I took, I, I've been programming in Java for at least 10 years. I'm going to try and talk about situations that everybody deals with, uh, whether you're a front end programmer, a back end programmer, or whatever. Try to frame that so that, hey, you can, this is the way you might do it in your language, but uh, this is another way you can do it with Scala Z, and I'm going to try and convince you that um, in, in these situations, Scala Z might be a really good choice. This is some SBT um, code, the Scala build tool. And so I just, it's, pr it's very easy, you only need to depend on one thing. So you say, give me Scala Z core. Uh, I'm going to talk about version 6. Version 7 is in the works, it's almost ready, but, and it has some differences. Um, but so in case it matters, I'm just going to talk about 6, and 6 will be around for a while anyway. Uh, and then all you need to do um, is import the small s scala z, everything in that, and then the large s scala z, everything in that, and then you get everything. So it's really, you don't have to guess what you need to import. Just import everything, and it'll just, you'll get all this cool stuff. The first kind of use case I'm going to talk about is memoization. So what your sort of computer science 101 or, or whatever kind of topic. So the, the idea to review is you have some expensive function. It has a, takes a lot of time, it uses a lot of resources, it uses a lot of memory, it uses a lot of whatever. Uh, but it has a nice, your function is nice because for every input for if you give it the same input, it'll produce the same output. And so you only have to call the function once with a particular argument, and you can save the result, so you don't have to spend the time or money, whatever, um, over and over again. You can just save the result. So does that make sense? We do this all the time, right? We have caches and, and all sorts of stuff. So this is one way you might implement that in a, in a typical way. And you could, this is the Scala version, and you can imagine the Java version with Google Guava, or just using a hash map or something like that. So I have a cache, and I'm just going to, I made up these types, foo and bar. And so if I give it a foo, I'm going to get a bar out. And so the way you do this with a cache is, uh, with, with a map, I'm sorry, is there's this method called get or else update. And so it's pretty straightforward. You say, give me, the, give me whatever corresponds to the key f, and if you don't have it, call this function. And then the map will store the results of that function if it, if it wasn't in there. So, so that way, uh, when you run this more than once with the same key, it's really fast versus the expensive first one. No problem. So, but there's a little bit of a, of a downside. Um, it's really long. Um, you're kind of repeating yourself. If you're, 
if you pass in f and then you have this expensive f, and you pass in g and you pass in expensive g, and maybe you could do some trickery to, to do that automatically. Um, but also, we kind of just had a function to start with, this expensive function, and you just took a foo to a bar, and it was just a map git or an apply on that, on that function. But now there's this long method name, and it doesn't quite look like our function anymore. It's, we're exposing the, the implementation of our cache. So maybe we want to hide it, because like, yeah, I'm going to add caching, but I don't want to change the way that my clients interact with the thing that I'm exposing. So here's another way you might do it in Scala. Uh, I found this with default method on map, which I hadn't known before. I was like, oh, cool, that will do it, right? Because I give it a default um, function to use if the key is not found. But, but don't do this, because it actually doesn't cache. It just says, oh, I don't know what to do. I'm going to delegate. It doesn't actually store it after you compute the expensive thing. So, so don't do that. So this is the Scala Z way. And I'll try and, try and give a pro-con argument uh, about this particular mechanism. So what's nice is we have our expensive function that we want to uh, cache. And, and we can just create this new thing that I've called memo. And I, I, there's what looks like a, a factory method. So OK, it's a factory method. And I'm going to make a memo. And all I do is say, give it the function that takes the input, and, and then here's, the, here's how you compute the value of the input. And then this memo thing will do the job of caching the results so that if, it's, if it doesn't have it, it'll go fetch it. And if it already has it, it'll just pull it right out of memory right there. Um, so it has the same behavior as the good cache. And so what I like about this is that we had a function that we would pass you know, this f foo into, expensive. And now we just pass the same f into this other function, memo. So we could, re if we were producing a, something for other people to use, it would look exactly the same. Uh, it had the same signature as our original function. So that's pretty cool. We don't have to do these fancy get or else update kind of things. Uh, so I like that. Everybody, pretty simple stuff, no problem. So it's just like a simple wrapper. And then what's, what also is nice is that uh, there's different strategies you can plug in. So maybe, uh, maybe you're going to use this immutable map version, or maybe for some reason due to performance or the access patterns, uh, there's a mutable map version. Uh, you'll have, you can decide for yourself. But then there's the, the, the fancier ones, like maybe I want to have a, a, use a weak cache map. So a weak cache map, uh, if you're not familiar, is something that if there are no other references to those keys, in, out in the world, you don't really need to store the, the values in the map anymore because nobody needs them. So they'll become eligible for a garbage collection. So that's sort of like a cache that forgets stuff eventually. Maybe three and a half. And then maybe you want a fixed size, um, a fixed size cache. So you can, if you can map your your keys into integers, then then you can do that. So it's nice. Keeps the signatures the same. This is, so this is the this is the first example where Scala Z. It's, it's really easy. You just find these uh, these constructors. You wrap functions, and then you have a new function which does exactly the same thing except it caches. No problem. Sound good? And then maybe so. Kind of the good thing is it looks like the thing that you're wrapping. It's a function. It's got the same type. But maybe you want if you wanted some more control, like only only throw things away on Tuesdays or whatever your strange logic might be for your enterprise app, then you can, you don't quite get that. But there are constructors in the uh, Scala Z library where you could write your own strategy. So if you want to be an expert, you can do that too. Any questions on that? Everybody hear me okay? Is the code too small? It's okay? Could we uh, define that? Uh, as a busy file? Uh, the result of calling memo? Yeah. Well, if you made um, memo lazy, that would just mean like whoever uses, whoever references <laughs> memo first, would that would be when this constructor would be called. So that doesn't change too much. No, I think the, uh, the main method itself. Oh, if you just, if you try to put in memoization yourself using some kind of lazy evaluation technique. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, I would argue that 
perhaps that's not the best way to structure it because uh, you could instead have the expensive version and then you can layer on top of that caching the memoization. So, so why make, it, it, to me it would be better to keep your expensive function whatever the implementation is and not sort of add this extra caching. And then I don't think, I don't think just using lazy in particular places would necessarily help. So uh, what I, and part of the thing about um, functional programming and, and, and things like Scala Z is, is it kind of helps you break apart these different things that are, that represent different concepts. So you might have a function that does something, but then you, you pass it to this other thing and it wraps that function and produces a new function which adds a little behavior and then you can add a little behavior and add a little behavior there. So I'd probably recommend separating caching from the thing that you are, that's producing the values. All right, thank you. Sure. Yeah. And also a, a lazy evaluation could only handle one foo. You could then pass yeah, it exactly. to something else. Yeah, so you know, lazy is just for a val that's sitting somewhere uh, in a data structure or, or on, the, you know, on the stack when you're calling something. So it, 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 it's just going to go away eventually. Or it, it's only going to hold one thing, right? Yeah? Uh, is this caching thread safe? Is it thread safe? I believe it is. Let's, let's check after the, let's go to the source later and we'll check it out. Great. Do you use the recache map and your keys were, say, into the going to get box? I think that would um, not interact well with um, the uh, weak reference mechanism that underlies that kind of hash map. Right, right. So if you use something well, that's of a more primitive type, like int, where it is what it is, as a key in a weak hash map, then it's never going to go away because it just exists. So. No, it's boxed. Oh, I'm sorry, it's boxed. There's the boxing issue and the caching issue, and, and if, I, I think if, just to make sure I get through all the stuff, uh, I'll, I'm going to move on, unless, unless you have a great question. <laughs> I hope it's a great question. I, I agree, I agree. Uh, can you compose memo and cat and return another function? So can you reassign, uh, can you wrap, you know, ex can you, memo is wrapping expensive and then reassign to, you know, expensive essentially, like that? Uh, like like if, if expensive was a, a var or, you know, something else? Well, if I remember, you can, read the, you can create a new val f. If you're composing functions together and then you happen to assign the, the composition to something else, then you can use it. it. The stuff that it's it's referencing doesn't go away. It just like it's like you you might define a val and a function, um, and then you pass that val in. If, if somebody does, forgets about the val, it doesn't mean it's gone away. So you, you can do that. Just some little stylistic things, um, and this is going to be more about there's some little niggles inside of Scala, and or maybe you have some deep nesting and you want to figure out a way to make your code more readable. This is kind of a, a fun little part. Um, so like a lot of times you, you have, uh, you, you end up using a lot of temporary variables because you have this strange belief that you might log them someday. Have anyone do this? So you have like a function from A to B and then you have another function B to C and you, so you have the input to the whole thing. It's an A and then you pass it into F and you get a B and you assign it to a val because you might need it later and then you pass the B into G and you get a C and you, you know, and, that, and that's the thing you want. Well, uh, you know, if you wanted to save some space, you might just, you know, call the functions in the order that you, uh, you know, wanted originally. So, you know, you have A and you pass it into F and the output of that will go into G. So that's just, but sometimes, I find that kind of ugly. Like imagine if you had 12 of those nested together and they had some horrible names or something like that. Um, so in, with Scala Z, you can use this pipe greater than <coughs> operator. This is uh, one of two strange looking operators that, Scala Z, that I'm going to show you about Scala Z. Um, Scala Z, some of the critique of Scala Z is that it has these weird operators that I'm only going to show you ones that you should remember. Right now. Um, so if you remember this, and, and so my mnemonic is, is this is like the Unix pipey thing. So I have it, it like I'm like in Bash or you know in the shell. You have an input, and you pass it to something that processes it, 
and then you pass the output of that to another thing, and then you get your final result. So if you're doing something like g of f of a, you can write it as a pipe greater than into f, and then pipe greater than into g. That's the same thing. So that's that's fun if you have if you want to show something that's being this linear process. You don't necessarily have to use all the silly parentheses. Um, here's Here's one thing, people miss their, their ternary operator. So, you know, if you're a C programmer or Java programmer, there's no uh, ternary operator. So this is kind of a, a fake version of it. Uh, so you have a Boolean test, P, and if it's true, it, does the, it, it gives you the value of the first part, and if it's false, you use the pipe character as, as the uh, colon, uh, and you get the second one. And then kind of similarly, if you have something like an option, you're always, uh, you often say get or else, which is how many characters? Nine characters? Well, that's way too many. So you could just use pipe. You could say, I have my option. If, if it happens to be none, you know, use this other thing. Um, and I think, so, so my, my hope is that's sort of a low surprise syntax or, or naming scheme. So uh, you have to know it before you can know what it is, but now you know it, and it's not so bad, right? It's, it's okay. You, you'll survive if you see this stuff. And it can, in some, in some cases, it can make your code just a little bit easier to read, and every little bit of readability helps. Uh, then finally, kind of in the style section, um, there's the constructors for option, and then I'm gonna show the constructors for either. So usually you put the type on the outside and the value on the inside. Well, with Scalazy, you can do it the other way. You can have the value, and then you say dot sum, and you get a sum of the wrapping that value. Uh, or none, or you can type the none if you want to. Uh, and then I'll, I'll show you the either. It's the same thing. Uh, there's the traditional way with right and left, and you can put in the type annotations or not. Uh, but in Scala-Z, you can do it the other way around. You say, here's my value, it's a right, and the left side, in this case, is going to be a string. Yes? So uh, there's this type called, so option is a type. Oh, so I'll, I'll do option first. So option is something that may or may not exist. There's two subtypes of option. One is sum, I got something. And none, I don't have anything. And so you can use that for something that is an optional value. And then either is like a type that has two types, but only one of them. So either is the main type. There's a left side and a right side. And the value that, if you have a value that's an either, it's either a left or a right, but not both. And so you, you can do some cool tricks with it, and I'll go into that. Yes? Typo. No, you're actually not right. So if you, if you call right without assigning it to a value that says what type it is, it will be type right. And that's actually one of the sort of hidden parts of the slide is that if you use the Scala Z version and you make a right, it'll actually return it as an either. And in certain <coughs> magical situations in, with implicit blah, 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 that actually makes a difference because uh, with the traditional constructors, you have to say what the types are um, and you can get stuck. You have a value that is one of these subtypes and you want to treat it as the general type but somebody didn't write their covariance correctly, and so it gets messed up. Um, but that, that, is, that is accurate, I, I think. But let me know if it's not. But, um, that's one difference between these constructors. One, the, the built-in library returns the subtypes, whereas Scala-Z returns the supertype, which is a bit more accurate. So these are fun. The, the main goal, though, is really to just try and make your code more readable if you believe that those things actually do. Um, one thing that I like to point out is um, lowercase letters are easier to read than uppercase letters. Capital S sum versus little s sum, or capital L left versus lowercase L. 
Maybe it's just me, but it's a little bit easier to read. Okay. So, this is going to be the meaty stuff. Your brain might explode, but I did not want it to explode, and it's my goal to make it not explode. Um, so I'm going to talk about a very normal problem that we all deal with all the time. This is probably like half of our job, and that is domain validation. And so what, what does that mean? So let's say we're trying, we're trying to model things in the real world, like a social security number. And in a social security number, I think, there's three digits followed by two digits followed by four digits. And so you've got to make sure if somebody is giving you input and you're trying to make some object that represents a social security number in your system that it has the right amount of digits. But you know, an int can have any number of digits, right? And somebody could fill in the wrong value. So that's bad. We want to we want to try and avoid that. Uh, you know, another thing, make a, a ver if you had a version class. Oops, somebody put in a, a negative version number, and Scala, as it is right now, it doesn't have unsigned ints, so you can be you can suffer from this. Or here's another. Thing where this is like a dependency. I depend on this library with this name and this version. And so maybe someone passes in an empty string, because it's still a string. It doesn't say non-empty string, it says string, and strings can be empty. So we want to avoid that situation. And, and we all have invented our own ways of dealing with this. There, in Java world, there's all sorts of ways. Uh, it would, annotations and then some, there's some annotation processor that generates some code that at runtime does all this stuff. stuff blah, blah, blah. Uh, so it's just really hard. We gotta, it's kind of a failing of our, our, our type system. Like if we had more precise types, then we can never really go wrong. But we don't in a lot of cases. So what do we do? So this is like the normal solution. Uh, it's valid in, in Java and in Scala. So usually, you in your constructor of your of your classes, you you blow up if something's bad. So in Scala, that's a require. There's other versions, but require will throw an exception if the condition is not met, and then you can give it an error message. So I'm requiring that the major version is greater than or equal to zero, and I'm requiring that the minor version is greater than zero. So there's a couple of deficiencies of this. Um, well, well, one is you're dealing with exceptions now. Like, if you want to, do you, do you catch it from when you make one of these things? Do you, what type should I catch? Is it a runtime exception? Is it an illegal state exception? Is it a legal argument exception? Well, you can look that up, but you know, then you have this try-catch logic and you're trying to recover from that. Or maybe you don't recover from for that. You have to kind of decide to have a policy about what things you try and handle and what things you don't try and handle. Um, and then kind of the other deficiency would be if the major, if both, in this case, if both the major version and the minor version are bad for whatever reason, you'll only really get notified that <coughs> the major version was wrong. And if you fix that and then you know, make a new one, then it'll blow up again and you, you, you should have known about it already. So that's kind of a, a straw man that I'm trying to knock down in terms of, it's, 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 it mostly represents how I think sort of the normal validation sequence goes. So catching exceptions is, is just bad. I mean, it's in the sense of it's noisy, you're using the stack as control flow versus something more, uh, you know, do I rethrow this exception that I get? Do I turn it into a different kind of exception? And I would argue there's not really many good patterns about that that we can use. So I'm going to try and show you a different way of modeling the whole situation that that is a very solid pattern for dealing with these kinds of problems. So um, let's let's imagine that we're going to. We're going to try and create a, a, one of these version objects, and we have some inputs to it. And there's this magical uh, method called validate. And it's going to take the inputs to my constructor, the major minor version. And it's going to produce something that we don't know what it is yet, but it's going to produce this thing. And then 
what, what if we could do some sort of normal operations on it? Like this thing, if, if it was invalid, we could kind of do the same get or else trick, like in option. And if it was invalid, maybe we want to provide a default value. That, that's kind of, that would be a nice thing that, to do uh, for handling of bad inputs. And then maybe, well then we need, you know, if, if, if I don't want to use that better, then, uh, you know, I need to handle the two cases. The two cases are, it worked and it didn't work. And so there's like, usually that's rep represented by a full function in Scala. So I give it a function that handles the failure case. I give it a function that handles the success case and then, and then I'm done. So things either work or they don't and, and I can kind of deal with that. So this is just kind of, uh, it's a little bit cleaner. We're handling both situations uh, and, and we're gonna try and fill in what, what might actually let us work this way. So um, in Scala Z, so there's a type that rep, everything's a type in, in Scala Z, so there's a type called validation. And a validation is either a success or it's a failure. Just like an op, there's, just like option has some and none, and either has left and right, validation, if you have one of them, it's either a success or a failure. And so in this, in, in, if we were validating this version, this simple version object, if I got I had good inputs, I would get a success, which would wrap the thing that I've validated. And if I put in a bad value, like the minor version, then I get this failure with this empty list thing, which I'll talk about. And you know, and it's maybe there's some type for the error. So maybe it's a it's a string or something like that that describes what's wrong with, with the inputs. So just like there's some and none, there's Failure, success and failure for validation. Pretty simple. So then it's okay. We have these. We can produce a success or failure given some kind of test. How do we how do we make one of these things? So let's say we want to model that constraint where the uh, a version a, a digit in a version. I guess it's technically more than one digit, but a part of a version has to be greater than or equal to zero. So it's got to be unsound. Um, so there's this validation type, that's the super type, and uh, the left side is the failure type. So if, if this thing is bad, I'm going to return a string that describes what's bad about it. And then on the right hand side is the thing that I'm actually saying would be okay. So in this case it's an int. And so making one of these validation things is really easy. I can, I can just have a Boolean test, and I'm using the pseudo ternary operator trick that I got. So if it's true, you know, if it's greater than zero, then it's going to be a success. And I use kind of the, the dot syntax with the, the failure type just to disambiguate it. So I have a success, I have a success which wraps that digit. And then if it, if it isn't greater than or equal to zero, then I'm going to give it this error string and I'm just going to say, oh, that thing's a fail, which is kind of cool. And then that produce, those are the constructors for this validation type. So now we can validate each part of the version individually. So we got to combine them together now because a version is really only valid if both of the digits are valid. So what the hell is this? Uh, so we have our we can validate each digit with that thing at the top that we just wrote. Mike? May I ask a question? On yeah. your previous slide, um, on your previous slide, you had that success and it's typed as a string. The, so, I just missed the point of why that's a string. I thought on the right it would be providing an int, but you're saying. So the, 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 di the type of digit is int, and I'm calling that the success. And then for disambiguation reasons, I have to say what the failure type is. I tried it without it, it didn't work. So I trusted the compiler that I needed to say that it worked, but it worked. Perhaps there's a way to wiggle it, but, but that's a good point, because it looks like I'm kind of calling that success a string, which is a failure type, but that doesn't make sense. So it's really saying, I'm okay, but here's the failure type, Mr. Compiler. 
Sorry? Yeah, the, the, uh, either has the same problem. If you if you, you you're you're fixing the the uh, the right side, so you got to say what the left side is. So just like you're fixing the success side, you got to tell the compiler what the failure side is. Even though I told it, I'm not sure why. So so we can do digits, but but now we got to do both of them. Oh yes, sorry. Why it work with fail? Why does it work with fail? That's a very good question. Because this or essentially the or case of the ternary is actually a function, and it's passing in the success to that. The, basically, the type information of the success is being passed along to this guy. So when it's returning a fail, the compiler can say, well, I know that the fail should be the fail type of the thing that this other guy was. So you have to, you get this one for free by putting that one. I wish you could push it all the way up, but it doesn't seem to work. So I'm going to, so we, to make this valid version, we got to do the major side and the minor side. And there's a bunch of stuff here. Don't worry. We're going to talk about what all this junk means. But if you block out some of this stuff, we're essentially saying validate the major digit. And then this thing, which is some kind of operator. This is number two weird operator. It's OK. I, have, I, have some, I asked and people last night what the name of that thing might be. And they, they said it's the Macaulay Culkin Home Alone operator. Like, but I think I have a I think I have a better name. It's to me it's the uh, it's the Admiral Akbar operator. Do you know Admiral Akbar? Yeah. No response. <laughs> I'm gonna call it the Akbar operator. It's a try. Remember that? Okay. Because it's kind of, it's an A. And it kind of looks like his weird fish head or whatever he is. He's a mollusk or I don't know. Uh, a shrimp. I don't know what he is. Um, so, so we're going to validate the major digit. We're going to use Admiral Akbar. And we're going to give it the, we're going to validate the minor digit. So we're kind of combining together the, the two validations with Admiral Akbar. And then what else is going on? Then, then this, OK, then I'm passing whatever that thing is. Uh, into a function, curly braces function. Got it. Okay, function. And the function I'm calling is is version something something. So what what does version something something mean? Um, so if if you put in underscores into a function, you're not actually invoking the function. You're saying I'm going to worry about that later. So version takes the two ints. So what that really says is this is a function that's going to take two ints and then produce a version, because that's the version constructor function. Is that clear? Like when you make, like this, like if we go back to the, um, the definition of a of, of version, if you, call, if you wrote out version 1, 2, there's the two arguments. And so by saying, version underscore underscore says, give me the constructor for a version. And the type of the constructor for version, it takes two ints and it produces a version. That's all it is. So, so we validate the major, add my bar, validate the, the minor, minor digit, and then, and then we pass it this function which takes the two digits. Okay, I validated two digits, and only if they're valid, then it's going to invoke this other function that takes two digits, well, that works out, and produces a version. So I'm going to go into sort of how that all works. But that's kind of the general shape. I validate the parts and glom them together with Admiral Akbar. And then I pass it a function which takes all the good values and makes the thing that I really wanted. So let's break down what that line was. So, with the types. So I'm going to validate the major digit. 
that gives me a validation of string and int. The left side is the failure. I'll get a fit. I get a message about what's bad about it if it's bad, and I'll get the good good int value if it's good. So then, lift fail nil. This is a complicated name. Um, so if I break it down, um, so the reason we're going to call this, well, I'm going to skip that. But I'll just break down, and then I'll tell you why we're going to do it. So lift. Lift is a very Scala Haskell-y word. All it means is I'm going to do something up there. <laughs> so lots of these validation things would be, you know, I have a validation where the fail. Let's just say the failure types are all the same to make it easier. Uh, if I'm combining a validation with the success types are A and B, I glue them together. I give it a function that takes an A and a B and it produces a C. And then I get a validation now of X of C. So this is how you combine or compose, as we like to say, validations together. And you know, for the three R case, A, B, and C, you then pass it a function which takes three arguments, and so on and so forth. Yeah? So uh, when you get the list of strings, uh, which represents the list of validation errors, mm -hmm. uh, how can you tell which one is that should check the fed out? Like if it has just one of the two, right? Right. So, so the question is, if it's the failure case, how do you know what actually failed? You know, how can you map it back to the input or something? Uh, so it's, it's really up to you. So um, you could just describe what went wrong you know, via a string, which is kind of analogous to like uh, just a blank runtime exception, because you only get that in string. So analogously, you could make the failure type a tuple that has uh, the type of the value that failed, which in this case would be like an int. But that gives you the value of the, and, and then you know, a tuple of that and a string, which describes what, what, went, what went wrong. But then if, there, if, you have, if you're validating something like major and minor, where they're the same type, how do you disambiguate? So then you needed a way to encode major versus minor. And then it gets kind of arbitrarily complex. And you can go down that route if you want. But uh, you, know, you, could, you can make an error code class. And hopefully that wouldn't be a lot of work. There, there, you need some way to denote this versus that if, if they are the same type. Second sort of tunnel, right? You, second sort of tunnel, right? With this exception, you still have the same problem. Sorry, can you say that again? If you throw an exception, you still need to describe what went wrong. Yeah, you see, the, we're not avoiding the problem of describing what's going wrong. We're just changing the way that you can um, deal with these things. Right. So and, and, then, and then, like, glom them together. If you try to do this with exceptions, where you need to validate a subpart, you need to build this thing which catches exceptions and adds them to a list to call, you know, themselves, and then, you know, with this, it's very easy to do that. And there's, there's really, I'm not, it would be cool if you could use reflection and just say, oh, this is the type, and I know how to do, deal with it programmatically after that. Question? So what's the signature of Akbar? Is it, does it return the validation now pair x, y, comma, a? Um, what it actually returns is, it, it kind of punts, because uh, in the sense that it returns what's called an app applicative builder. So, so that's, that's a fa fancy, fancy word. Like an applicative builder. Um, so you can think of it as, so like in a, the builder pattern from OO land, um, it's something that kind of accumulates things until you're ready, and then you say, I'm ready, and then it produces the value. Um, it does the same thing. So it, it basically, the, 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 the difficult part is each thing you're accumulating can be a different type. So if you look at the, the source for Akbar and what it, what it acts on, uh, this thing, there's a version which has 22 different type parameters to handle all the combinations. That's what I expected, but I guess so. It takes care of the bookkeeping to collect all the It does values. it for you, yeah. Why is it also collect, why is it, why is it doing the null for? I guess I'm surprised, because it seems like you're hand doing 
available setup. Yeah, it seems yeah. like it's a it's a bad uh, it's a bad deal because you're always typing it, and why why should you have to do that? So in the cheat sheet, there's a way to construct a a, a fail that's automatically a null wrapped in a null. So you can do that ahead of time, so you don't have to do it when you're combining them together. Uh, or Akbar can just generate the null for the first time. You could you could make the uh, the the very handy nail Akbar operator, which does that. Yeah. The um, Akbar is <laughs> you don't like it <laughs> more generic than the used triplet validation, so I can't make that assumption. Yes, that's that's actually very that's a very good point. So you could special uh, Akbar is a very special thing. I'm not going to go into it because it's one of the things I said I want to talk about. I can talk about it later, uh, after the talk. But it's, it operates on things. It doesn't know that validation is a validation. It, it only knows certain properties of that validation has, so it can do its magic. So if you specialize Akbar to only work on a special version that would only work on validations, then you can do that trick. Um, so these are sort of the rules of combination. This is like the, the Boolean truth table. Uh, so, so naturally, if you're combining two successes, you get a success. And then in all the other cases, you get failures. And because we're, we're doing anti-fail fast, whatever that is, uh, we need to accumulate the failures. So, so this is the reason why we lift it into a list, or we create it, we, or we make the failure type some kind of uh, containerish object right away, so that down the line, when we combine it, the validation can just say, oh, I know how to glom things together. It's a list and it's a list. And I just you know, append one list to the other. So under the hood, that's what applicative is doing. If there's failures, accumulate them all together. If you're using this nail thing, it knows how to do that. Uh, otherwise, you know, you got a success. So it, it's pretty easy to reason about. And in the end, you still will get either a success or a failure. If you get a success, it'll have the thing you want from the combination. And if it's failure, you'll get all the failures. So that's really cool. You don't have to mess with exceptions. Uh, you know, in the set, you know, you're not dealing with the stack. You're not dealing with these nested uh, structures and, and rethrowing and interpreting that. You can just kind of get everything that that went wrong and handle it on your own. Uh, and then, I guess another good thing is that, um, you know, you're only really dealing with functions. I have a function which takes some inputs and produces this validation thing. And it's pretty easy to make one of those validation things. I just tack on success or fail to the actual value that I'm dealing with. And, um, and then the way to, to glom them together is, is also just kind of a function. You pass in a function to handle the success case and validation handles the failure case for you. So it's pretty cool. So that was a lot. There's this lifting thing, which is kind of annoying. There's this operator that I call Akbar. Tell your friends. Um, but you can build up. Once you have the validation of these uh, small things, you can make bigger and bigger ones, which is kind of cool. So if you had web forms, you can imagine lines being validated, and sections being validated, and pages being validated, and you would get all the things that were wrong all in one shot versus something complicated. But, but you're saying lifting is like kind of annoying. Can it be done implicitly? Can the lifting be done implicitly? So that kind of goes to the question uh, with the gentleman in the back about why do I have to type lift? You don't have to type lift. You could produce a validation that, so um, the technical reason that we don't just use string is because if I'm like the dumb validation class, I want to add failures together, whatever that means, for any type. If I add together strings, what do you, what do you think of? That's not the question you asked? No, no, no. I'm asking about why not uh, declare that lift operation as implicit so that it's done like uh, in oh, the right. context and like wrapping into the monitor. I don't know. We maybe we could maybe after this we could try and figure out a way to do that so we could all save typing. I'm all for saving typing. Um, so I'll forget whatever my digression was. <laughs>
So how's, how's validation? That was the hardest thing. It's, it's easier from now on. Everyone's, there's no blood coming out of the ears. We're good? OK. Let me know. We can talk more about that after. So this is the final sort of um, practical intro. And it's, it's something uh, you know we all did memoir, we all did caching slash memoization. Uh, we all try to make our code more readable. We all are validating data that we get from somewhere all the time and trying to figure out if it's good or not. So the last example is like dealing with nasty data structures. I, I, I this, the the uh, the title is the most intimidating part of this. The rest of it's really easy. So um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I have this bogus example where let's. Pretend we're all freshmen in college in or, or whatever, and we're making a tree structure. So a tree, there's a node class, and a node holds something. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make a tree of this foo thing. I just made it up. And it's got the uh, it's got two fields, it's got a name and a factor, you can it's warp factor, I don't know what it is. Um, and that's the thing I'm gonna put in my tree. And then I have a node class which holds that value. And it might have some children. So you could construct a tree out of this thing. And so here's like an example tree. There's a root node. Its name is root. It's got factor 11. That's pretty awesome. And then it's got two children. So I'm going to make up a task. And you can, you can map this to any sort of task that you have. It's sort of meant to represent some weird thing that your boss asks you to do or there's some weird requirement that you need to fulfill. So let's say I have this tree. And for all trees, I want to find the second child. I'm just going to assume there is one. I'm not going to handle that case. And I want to go into the value of the second child, and I want to multiply its factor by 4. OK? I'm just going to, I want to find that guy and multiply it by 4. They're not creating a new tree. What? Creating a new tree. Oh, yes. We're in Scala. We do not mutate. We produce a new tree that has the value that we want in it. And that's good. Do not mutate. So this is how you would do it You know, if you just started writing code. Not, not that you're a beginner, but you just sat, I'm just saying you sat down and, and needed to do it. Like, you know, you got to do it. And it's, Scala's nice. You make these, you, you, if I'm, I'm going to go back, uh, you have these case classes, which makes it nice to create this stuff. And case classes give you all this free stuff. They're immutable. That's really great. And they give you a free copy constructor, or a copy method, which produces a copy of that, case, that uh, class. And just before it's done, you can, you can say, oh, actually do this to the, the field. You know, change of value. So, so if I was writing out how to do find the second child, get its value, update the factor field, I might do something like this. So I make a function, and I'm going to take the, the node, and I'm going to, I need to produce a new node, because I need to make a new tree. And so I'm going to copy it, and when I copy it, I'm going to, I need to mess with its children because I need to go into the second child and do this stuff. And then, so I'm going to pull out the second child, and I'm not going to do error checking, but you should. And then I'm going to produce a new list where I'm updating the second child, the child at index 1. And then, so, so OK, I, I've got a new set of children, but I need to actually mutate, or I need to produce the, the value that I want. If I say mutate, I'm not meaning mutate, but I might say it anyway. So, Bear with me. So then we need to go and change the, uh, the factor value. So then I need to copy the second, and I need to get the value out of it. And I'm repeating myself all over the place. I have temporary variables, and then I'm saying second.copy. And then I want to edit. I want to give it a new value. But I need to, since I want to modify the value that's already there, I need to refer to it. And there's, there's all this repetition. And we can all say that this code is, is messy. If. So this is another what if scenario. What, 
what if I could just separate the pieces that I want and somehow magically combine them together? So, so what I mean is, what if we had this thing second, which just sort of points to the second child? Like, I don't know where the second child is. Okay, we're, we're, we're refactoring that mess of code. We're turning it into its parts. So I'm getting the second child, and then I'm getting, if I, if I have a node, I, I can get its value out. That's just you know, going into the data structure. And then if I have the value, which is this food class, I can pull out the, the, the factor field. So if I could somehow combine those things together into this, this other thing, then, then I could, there would be this tree, and I could just like point deep into it. And I'd be looking at that one thing that I want to do whatever to. So it's like I, I have the path to it in like JSON or XML sort of processing. Or I have, I have the address of the second child's factor field. And now, now I, I could, it would be great if I could just have that combined thing and pass in my tree and it would say, here you go. The, val the second child's values factor is two. Because I just I give the tree and it looks and it's, it's 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 got its like telescope and it's looking right there and it says here's the value. And then once I have that that pointer deep into the thing, I, I could like set it and it would produce a new tree where just that thing was changed. Or maybe oh it'd be even cooler if I could just modify it and I and I pass in the tree and I give it a function that whatever was in there where the underscore is, it fills it in with the real value, and then I can say, oh, I'm on the multiply by four, which is sort of the, the original problem. That would be really cool. So, so in Scala C, that thing is called a lens. Sort of the idea, you have a telescope into this thing, and then you can act on it. You can both look at it and I don't know what the technical term is, but then you can like imagine you're looking through the other end of the telescope and you're producing a whole new thing where the world has the value that you changed it to. I don't know. That's sort of one way to describe it. Um, but if so, a lens, the type of it is you have the thing on the outside that you want to poke into, and then you have the thing that you're looking at through the lens. So if you if you have a lens that gives you the second child that takes a node and it's going to give you another node, right? And if you had just a value, if you had a node and you want to find its value, that's just, in this case, a foo node gives you a foo. And then to get the factor out of the foo, it's just a, a thing that takes a foo and produces an int. So that's sort of the type thing. And then there's nothing special about these things because if you look at the constructor, of let's have the first one here, we we'll call it second, naturally. It's just a function, it's it's like a getter for that thing. So if the so the type of the of the underscore is foo node, so I'm just gonna get its I'm just gonna get the uh, child at index one. It's a getter. It's just a getter. It's all it is. And so then naturally the second argument to the lens constructor is the setter. So with a setter, but it's not, it's the thing is these getters and setters are not tied to a particular object in like in regular O programming. They can take any object and do a get or a set on them. So we have our node and we have the second child, C2. And all we're doing to sort of get a new node is we copy it and in the children's slot, we copy the existing child at index one and give, give it the new value that was passed in. So lenses are just, in, in Scala Z as they are right now, are just getters and setters put together. So this is kind of the more abstract view. You have some thing and you want to, you want to have a view on it. There's analogies like uh, a database view, which is part of their original motivation. Um, so it's got a getter, it's got a setter, 
And then you can do the things that we wanted to do in, in, earlier. We can, we can apply um, the lens to the thing that we want to look at, and we get, we get the view. And then we can do a set with the lens on the thing, and we can set the new view, and it will give you a new thing who would look different if we looked at it again. So, on a, on a few slides ago, we, we didn't know there were some question marks between these parts, between the uh, things that are addressing, addressing parts of the structure, and we want to combine them. So for lenses, it's just this and-then function. So it's pretty natural to read. I'm going to go to the second child, and then I'm going to get the value, and then I'm going to get the factor. No problem. So the, the type of this lens, which I should have added, uh, would be it'd be a lens which takes a foo node and produces an int. So let, let's see sort of how this is our example tree with the with the roots and the two children. So this lens is really poking through all the way into into the place which it says it's going to in the second child's factor. And second child's values factor. So it's pointing like that. And then in the modify case, which is kind of what I've used most with, just saying. Um, so here's the original tree. We're going to multiply the thing deep inside by four. And then we get a new tree, which is really cool. This, this whole operation produces a new tree with just that slot update. You could use, you could define Fibonacci in terms of a memoized function, but you could also define, so that would be like, that's one way to think about it, but you could also build it the other way where you have a function which returns the next Fibonacci number and you see it, and then you use the memoization facility itself to do the caching. Um, it's hard to explain that without going into it. So if you made, I, I'd have to go over it with you with some code to, in order to see it. But it's just because you can define Fibonacci different ways. So you, you're trying to not re repeat, you're, not, you're trying to not repeat computation. So if you, if you merely, so you have to give the parts of the computation to the memorization function. So the memorization function would have to refer to itself. So you can easily make it blow up and you can easily make it work. So I believe it is definitely possible to, to use this for that thing. It just depends how you how you structure it. It's not a good answer, but I'm gonna say yes you can do it. If you want to be okay, this is for the super nerds in the audience, everyone else, close your ears or whatever. So the memoization, the base memoization constructor takes a function and it has the exact same signature as the Y combinator. Okay, done. Thank you. <laughs> oh, there you go. Wow, I got clapping for the Y combinator. I didn't even want to say that part. Uh, I have a question about this policy. Uh, what was experienced by producing stay nice, well self-contained, or you put in a little bit of a salad because want to go crazy and no one can record anymore or the D of crazy when it's not people this time for it. So like where did it come from and why did they do it? Or, or whether introducing a bit of scala Z tends to be well behaved or tends to be like uh, stuck. You mean the authors of Scala Z? Yeah. How does everybody else do? How you how they use usage at all? Using it, right, right. So, so I think the, the problem has been that that there's no easy way into it, sort of teaching wise. Um, it, it would presume a lot of uh, if you talk about how it's implemented and the techniques that it uses. They're very advanced stuff. It's like if you walked into a graduate level math course, and that's. It's true and it's interesting, but it's a big barrier for people to use it. And so, um, I've just I, so I've been using Scala for a little more than a year, 
and then Scala Z sort of off and on in that time. And I would, I've been lost for a really long time. Because uh, you need, it's like um, I was explaining to people last night, like if I, if I said, if I use the terms differential and integral, if you hadn't taken calculus, you wouldn't know what I was talking about. But you kind of have a sense of what those things mean. So analogously, the, the concepts in Scala Z, we just don't, we're just not familiar with them. But if you were, it would make sense, which is a stupid thing to say because it's obviously true. But it's like you don't know it until you know it. And so, but the approaches have been, let's teach you the math, and then you can understand how to use the code, which doesn't work for everybody. And so I've been trying to collect examples where I know that I've done the sort of stuff in my job, caching and uh, you know, domain validation. And Scholarly is really good at this, uh, it's my argument. I'm just trying to show that. And then you can learn about monads and all that stuff, which is important. I guess the question was really, is Scholarly Lite a viable strategy? Is Scholarly Lite? I think it is, because um, if you try to do, if you try to do something like these things, like if you tried to make the validation class, um, you'd end up inventing weaker versions of, of what Scalzi already did. And because part of the magic is like you had you had this lens and that lens, and you combine them to, together and you get this other lens. And you have this validation and that validation, and you combine them together with that one Akbar, and then uh, you know, and they work. And so there's all this theory. That, said, that, says, that says if you follow these rules, it'll work. And if you try to do it yourself, it probably wouldn't work right. So it's like, it's like you know, calculus is invented, and now, now, we know, now we know how to use it. But before, only alignments and you know, those guys would just move up there. I don't know if that's a great analogy, but um, I think it's viable because no one has fallen asleep or left yet. So. It's a constructive proof, I guess. And thanks very much for coming. It was a good time.